Hello all, I hope you are doing well in these uh, uh, extraordinary times. Uh, I'm uh, Ali Patterson from uh, Fintech Finance. We do lots of magazines and videos. Uh, and welcome to today's World Stage keynote covering Europe. Um, joining me today is a man I usually see a lot on the conference circuit. Uh, I'm, sli I'm slightly gutted to not see you this year, um, but this is, uh, we have Got a surprise for you. Uh, um, I've been having a dig around, and I have actually found an old, uh, an old back base, old back base bit of swag there for you. Um, nice ladies and here is uh, Yauk, the CEO and founder of Backbase. There you go. Nice to meet you. I'm doing fine. Thank you. Oh, a wee, wee bit delayed there. And you're you're in Amsterdam at the moment. Yes, I'm uh, dialing in from Amsterdam. Brilliant, excellent. Greetings from Lon London. I, one of the things I wanted to highlight before we go into it, I absolutely love events. I love overhearing things. I love the actual main stages themselves because you come across those little nuggets of absolute gold wisdom that with all the best in the world, you can spend days Googling it and you just never come across it. And it's those, those random interactions that we want to try and obviously replicate here and get those things that stick in the back of your head so yeah. that when you're doing laundry later, you think, what Yark said there, I'm going to apply that to my business. That's, that's the goal. Ali, you're raising the bar. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get, uh, let's get straight into it. Now, first thing I want to talk about in terms of Backbase, every time, uh, and I don't know if any of the audience have uh, ever, ever spotted this, but any time there's an event, um, I suppose it's kind of lucky that we're doing this virtually. There is usually... Um, a bit of guerrilla marketing coming out of Backbase, uh, whether it be a side event and grabbing people to to bring them across into your own own event, or sabotaging a uh, arrivals by having your branding people with big cycling and big boards saying Backbase cycling round and round their uh, their venue. So let's talk about that. How would you describe Backbase's culture in the first bit? How, how would you describe who you, who you guys are and what you stand for? Yeah, uh, thank you for raising it. I think I think these examples they kind of illustrate that that Backbase is a challenger brand, and and we're we're not challenging for the sake of challenging. But uh, there's basically a, a status quo, I would say, in the traditional incumbent way of doing banking, but also with the incumbent software vendors. Uh, and and I think the Backbase brand is really kind of working together with the market to show, hey, there's a different way, uh, and kind of there's a new paradigm. So in that sense, uh, you know, in order to kind of get some attention and in order to kind of raise that voice, uh, you, you, we, we basically make a nice effort there to uh, to get more visibility and uh, you know to uh, to poke a little bit, to nudge a little bit, uh, you know, and and most players, uh, both customers as well as some of our competitors, you know, they, there's different reactions to it. But overall, I think what we're trying to do is eventually, in the end of the day, in my mind, it's a, it's a really positive brand and it's about a positive change and. Uh, it's okay to uh, to poke a little bit and to kind of uh, you know raise the bar. With with that in mind, these kind of activities, these slightly uh, again r rebellious activities, how does that translate internally into company culture? Is there a slight sort of feeling of if we can do this with some of our marketing, maybe we can actually push forward with some of our some of our products in ways that we hadn't thought of before. I would say the, the marketing uh, elements are, are a very little part of what we do, and I think they are not really a representation of, of the true company. <laughs> so, in all fairness, I think what we basically had to do is, is if you if you look at, uh, it, it's a beautiful moment in time right now. If you look at it, there, there's a massive innovation in the payment space, and many people are talking about it. But there's also a massive uh, disruption right now needed in how we can help people around the world basically to improve their financial life. So a couple of years ago, we went out with a North Star. We said, okay, we can talk about technology, we can talk about software, we can talk about marketing, but net-net, we as an industry and Backbase as a, as, as a partner of that industry, many of these financial services experience, you know, to onboard new customers or to, you know, do servicing, many of these experiences are really broken, right? If you compare them now, uh, so many, many companies in Silicon Valley, for instance, they talk about a 10x better experience. So, you know, Uber, prior Uber, it was very difficult to find a taxi. With Uber, one push, boom. That's a 10x uplift, right? Uh, if you look at banking, uh, a lot of these processes and these customer journeys are super broken. It's, it's almost like embarrassing. But, you know, look at how difficult it is to, for instance, become a customer of a bank, a net new customer. And I think there's a whole bunch of challenger players right now. We all know the names. 
they are showing the industry that if you if you kind of think it around if you kind of unlearn the classic way of working but if you embrace kind of modern digital technology digital mindset uh, that these things can be done 10 times better and they're still secure and they're compliant right so that's kind of i think the driving force that is really needed for this industry not to stick with the status quo or not to kind of say glass half empty because we cannot do anything because of the you know uh, the central bank or from a compliance point of view it's more about look at these great technologies that are out there mobile you can have a bank in your pocket every process we can rethink and reimagine and we can truly genuinely strive uh, to do that uh, 10 times better and that's the type of spirit i'm trying to build in, in backbase with our product squeak squads that we have around 500 people doing nothing else than product innovation so they're innovating like a revolut or an n26 the only difference is that we're not competing with banks but we're basically giving that type of innovation as a wide label uh to the banks to actually become you know to come to become on par and to kind of exceed to basically leapfrog uh, the incumbent way of working and instantly have that kind of neo bank uh, power, but but in the end of the day, it's all about unlearning uh, the classic mindset and embracing this uh, digital mindset. And yeah, maybe that's a bit of a challenging for some people that might feel a little bit like challenger. Okay, fair, but it's definitely needed for this industry. Absolutely, now all across the world, I, it always staggers me that whenever you Wikipedia banking in any country. There's always a handful of players that are the big five, the big four, the big three, all, all over the world. And yet they don't really have that kind of level of experience and I suppose um, brand loyalty as the likes of your Monzo's, Revolut, Starling, N26, etc. How, um, how do you think some of these very large incumbent banks can change their mindset to step away from just trying to do it as they always have done? which I think is the most dangerous thing in any kind of innovation is, oh, we've always done it that way. How can they internally step away from that approach and start to actually look at the product and actually th and actually deliver that 10x, 10x experience? Oh, I, I mean, I, I think we've now been in the industry and the whole fintech movement is going on for quite a while, right? So there's plenty, there's dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of banks that are, you know, super aware of how important digital transformation is. And, and many of them are somewhere in that journey. Some of them are really making massive progress. Others are making their first initial attempts. Uh, you know, it's all good and fine. I think there's definitely a, a formula that, uh, you know, as a bank, you can really think about your operating model. I think it's a very different game if you are a mega bank, like like a Bank of America. You, you can basically employ, you know, a thousand, two thousand people and you can hire the talent and you can do all the cool stuff with AI and you basically can pick up any new innovation or any new trend and you can crush it, right? So, but I think that's given for a, a small number of the mega banks. Then if you go a little bit down in the value chain, you, you, you basically see a lot of, let's say, regional banks, super regionals, credit union, community banks. They, they, they really kind of don't have the, the fighting uh, ammunition or the firepower to really kind of be competitive, not with the big guys, not the big banks, but also not with big tech or with, um, with fintechs, right? So there, I think the really the, the way forward is kind of a, a partnering model where you really kind of create, you know, an alliance where you say the credit union, the community bank, uh, they own, they know the community, they know the local people, they know the needs, they know finance, they know banking, and you really team up with, um, you know, an innovation partner like like a backbase or there's others, where you really kind of make this kind of alliance and say we know banking, you know tech, you know digital, you can bring that startup digital DNA, you can bring that innovation firepower. And uh, together we can really service uh, this local market. And I think that's a, that's a great one plus one is three type of uh, partnership. And that's really what we see happening around the world from with our customers in Japan to Korea, to uh, Australia, New Zealand, to Latin America and Ecuador, Peru, uh, to North America, the US. You, you really see on every continent, you see this, uh, this threat happen. Banks are fully aware they need to do the digital transformation. The question is more, how are you going to do the dig digital transformation? And, and what are the accelerators and what, what's your operating model on how to, uh, on how to make it happen. But uh, the, the, the urgency and the awareness is there. It's more kind of figuring out with your existing systems as a bank and with your existing culture and your risk appetite, you know, what is kind of the operating model that, uh, that works for these banks. And I would say some, some are, of them are very impactful. And for some, I also honestly, I'm quite concerned about uh, how much impact they uh, are not going to make in the next uh, you know five uh, five to ten years
uh, that's that's quite concerning. If you if you don't move, uh, I think eventually uh, you're you're not going to be competitive enough as a bank. Absolutely. I mean, as a bank, I mean, it's very clear that you you've got to have your own data center. You've got to have big high walls and lots of developers, and d don't work with any third parties. You know, keep it all keep it all in house. Keep it all safe. Are there uh, many? In all fairness, I think that attitude uh, maybe was relevant maybe five years ago, but that that is now really changing. I, I really think you can honestly say that. Uh, the majority of the banks now and also the, the regulators are people are fully aware that you, you don't have to build your own data center anymore. So there's definitely an understanding like banks are, I would say, pretty good in outsourcing. Right. But classically, they are outsourcing low value work or repetitive work. You outsource some software maintenance work, you outsource some some call center work. But they now start to realize that you can actually do strategic partnerships. Uh, where you can really leverage, you know, cloud infrastructure. So I think the, the the whole kind of outsourcing model and kind of working with best of breed partners, a lot of banks have been doing that for a very long time. We now see a, a new window where they basically realize I can I can outsource my infrastructure, let's say cloud, or I can outsource my digital engagement platform to really streamline all my digital customer interactions. You know, I can can almost kind of outsource the, you know, for instance, Backbase, we, very often our customers call us, yeah, you guys are the AWS of banking. You basically give us the instant innovation power, uh, or you guys are the Shopify of banking. You basically, what Shopify did to kind of make e-commerce available uh, to any small business owner to run e-commerce, right? Shopify right now is the second largest e-commerce platform after Amazon, but they have a partnership model uh, to guard together with uh, with business owners, right? Mm -hmm. So that's it's something similar is going to happen in the banking industry. Basically, I, I see it happening globally on every continent, including in the US, where these strategic partnerships, where you can leverage cloud technology, but you can also leverage, you know, the, the Shopify of banking or the AWS of banking. People like Backbase. Uh, those those things are true accelerators for banks. Um, to really make a big impact. So you, you, they can basically decide, am I gonna do the heavy lifting all on my own across you know, the full value chain, hiring the right talent, you know, building all these digital innovations? How much time would it cost me to acquire that talent? Can I retain that talent? Uh, how much uncertainty do I have in my, my roadmap execution? Versus, hey, there's a bunch of providers that I need a virtual card, boom, there's a provider. I need to do you know, real-time payments, there's another cloud provider. There's an engagement platform. So I would say a lot of the critical ingredients are nowadays available in the cloud. And it's all about how do you orchestrate that value and how do you compose those ingredients into a uh, kick-ass uh, customer experience? Absolutely. So the, I, I don't think the problem is not so much the technology or the capabilities that are around there. It's a super exciting time. There's a lot of capability out there. It's now more about the leadership and the decisiveness in in uh, for a bank and also leadership teams i, I work with, with with many banks around the world like how do we kind of create these strategic alliances to basically truly engage with customers to empower our employees to reinvent our processes to really optimize them because in the end of the day and, and that sounds maybe a little bit boring but banks truly not only have to kind of uh, excel in the customer experience 10x better but they also have to reduce their cost base i think that's that's the elephant in the room yeah you can do you, you can do a big great experience, but you know if your systems are still super bloated and you've got a gazillion amount of legacy systems floating there, compared to the alternative, it's too heavy and it's too costly and it's too slow. So you also really need to kind of transform into kind of a, a leaner uh, technology stack, uh, and that typically is cloud-based. Uh, you know to kind of get the, to get the economics right. I do love it when you hear about. Uh, um, I actually heard about a bank um, in. North Carolina, and they were still reliant on floppy disks, but the five and a quarter inch floppy disks, which blew my mind that that was kind of still part of the system. Um, with that in mind, I mean, it, it does that that castle no longer exists. Banks are very much now part of a forest, part of an ecosystem. They are looking to uh, to work with third parties in partnership. Um, mm -hmm. Want to expand about bank bases kind of role within that? Because one of the things that I was not surprised by, but I was quite surprised at the scale. Um, when I was fortunate in the before times to visit Backbase um, and, and see Backbase Connect and all you guys there, huge amount of partners there. Um, and people that I would often think, are, are you not competitors? But no, it was very much partnership. So where does Backbase sit in this fintech ecosystem around the world? How do you, what, what's sort of your, your, your role with them? And how do you partner with organizations that traditionally could be a competitor or even traditionally could be a, could be a customer. Yeah. 
I think the a simple way to explain back-based, back-based kind of really started kind of, uh, you know, on the glass, right? So on the smartphone, on the browser, we, we basically said, we call it our initial approach to the market was, let's say, banking. And banks are all about pushing products. So very much inside out, they've got all sorts of products, they have channels. Let's push these, these products via channels to the customer. So like 10 years ago, we went to the market and we said, think of back as the other way around. Uh, a 180 change in, 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 in perspective, like a paradigm shift. It's not about pushing, but it's about starting with the customer, outside in. So that was really, and that is still till today, 10 years later, the key word, outside in, start with the customer. And basically, Backbase is the customer engagement layer. So officially, we call it the digital engagement banking layer. And that engagement layer is going to streamline all your digital interactions for your customers as well as for your employees. So from online account opening, customer onboarding, product origination to servicing, you know, to block your cards, uh, whatever you need to do, alerts, notifications, financial advice, all of that is happening in that engagement layer, right? And ideally that is one single platform, just like Uber, you have a digital platform, the Uber platform, the taxi driver, the consumer, they're all collaborating on one and the same platform. So Backbase is the orchestrator, the engagement layer. The engagement layer needs input it needs kind of financial products. So for instance, a debit card, a credit product, uh, a mortgage, right? Typically the engagement layer of Backbase is connected originally, traditionally still, to core banking systems. So the legacy systems that are already in the bank. So the good news is we say, guys, you can really kind of own the customer experience layer and you can innovate, but we can connect to all your core systems. So that's the default approach. What happened in the last five years, there's now more and more FinTech capabilities where the people are really innovating with new product features, banking products, like virtual cars, like real-time payments, like risk scoring, like uh, big data capabilities where you can analyze uh, the customer payments history with their consent and you can kind of basically advise them or protect them uh, in, in their daily lives, right? So now what you see, and it's especially with these fintech partnerships you were referring to, we now see more and more that we are connecting to these fintechs that are basically B2B, right? So they are not directly operating to consumers, but they have new financial products available in the cloud, exposed via APIs. And their business model is like, hey, great, if we can connect our new virtual card capability, let's connect that to the Backbase engagement platform. And then as part of the overall customer engagement orchestration, you know, Backbase can utilize these capabilities in, in every journey. So for instance, if you do online account opening, we connect with KYC AML providers or we, we kind of connect with your third party banking account and we do instant account funding. Or uh, as part of digital banking, you do bill pay or you do, uh, you know, you do promotions and, uh, and campaigns. So th I think that's kind of the bigger picture uh, with or without Backbase, every bank, I believe you need an engagement orchestration layer, preferably one single platform to really orchestrate your digital value exchange and to impress your customers. And then below that engagement layer, you can reuse your legacy systems and at the same time, you can really drive innovation by having these strategic partnerships with these new B2B fintechs that basically help you to come to market with, with more innovative, more customer-oriented uh, products. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. So uh, as well as being able to plug into, obviously, let's say, a current uh, core banking platform, mm -hmm. um, if, let's say, uh, Banky McBankface then says, come on, Backbase, we'll plug you into the, into the back office one. A year later, they say, we're getting rid of this five and a quarter inch floppy version, we're going to this super cool cloud-based one. Um, what happens? What will the customer actually see? So, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I think that that, that is the beauty. Uh, the customer will notice because the digital engagement layer, let's say we always say the digital stop shop will stay open. People won't notice. And that's, that's really nice about this engagement architecture because at the connection to the core systems, to the floppy disk example, it's a loosely coupled connection. So initially to go to market fast, you really open the digital shop, you repurpose the legacy systems, but then over time you kind of create, to, exactly to your point, Ali, you create the optionality to decouple and, and deprecate some of these uh, legacy systems and indeed uh, replace them with uh, a cloud-based uh, modern alternative. But that's definitely, uh, that's basically a, a trend we see happening. Although the, the, the sequence we see is first you fix the engagement layer because the digital shop that is customer facing, that is what the customer will see. That's where you can grow your revenue, your margin, et cetera. And then over time, you can basically build your time to uh, renovate uh, the underlying product systems. Let's, um, let's talk about the customer. Now, you've mentioned you're working with banks literally all over the world. Um, mm -hmm. What is that one underlying theme that 
irrelevant whether obviously i know in the us they love cash love a check um whereas in somewhere like hong kong qr codes are all over the place what's the number one constant though throughout the world that is that customers are always or are always searching for in terms of in terms of product well i, I think really what is what the privilege if you travel around the world and you see so many cultures um I think in the end of the day we're serving people right and that's the, in my mind that's the that's the constant so uh, you know the end consumer is a human being uh, they're getting married uh, they they have life events they're they're getting children uh, they they need to kind of manage their family right they're, they need to protect their uh, uh, they need to take care of their pension capabilities small business owners right so in the end of the day i think the common factor is all about uh, generally mo the majority of the customers we work with they really kind of see a couple of things one they realize that the digital is is going to be the first and primary channel so they all from japan to north to north america to ecuador they all know that right and i think it's it's a no-brainer so they know it's going to be a, a digital first interaction model the second thing they know they all have in general they also know we really need to care it starts all with our end customer we need to kind of give them a better experience so it's the battle about the customer experience and helping people to improve their daily life i really think at a global scale people start to realize that you know there's only a, a finite amount of financial apps on your smartphone it, it might be google it might be apple it might be square venmo paypal and a whole bunch of other things but how do you make sure that as a bank either your community bank or a mega bank, but how do you make sure that you're one of those preferred apps? And that really means that app needs to be a 4.5 star in the app store. And it really needs to kind of provide all the capabilities to help people with their daily life, right? And if the payment is with a QR code or it's with a different method, it doesn't really matter. But the fact is that you are really competing about how do you become the bank that people really love? How do you really become uh, the preferred app? And, and that's if, I, if you look at it from a, a distance, and that's for consumers, that's for small business owners, that is for corporates, and for all these different banking segments, that's the battle. In small business banking, uh, I will just quickly say this, but for instance, a lot of the banking business could actually go to accounting platforms like Xero or Intuit. So you, you, you have your invoices already there, you can do your payments there, you don't even have to go to the bank anymore. Then these guys also start to provide capital and they do lending, you know, where's the bank? There's no bank, at least maybe in the background, but someone else owns the customer experience. So I think that is the major topic. How do you make sure that you actually master uh, the customer experience? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I know we're running out of time in a wee bit, so um, we've got to talk about the future. We've got to finish off talking about the future. What um, What is next for Backbase? I mean, I'm assuming you're not going to be jetting around the world next week or anything like that, but w where do you see Backbase heading? What's kind of the... Is there, is there, are you ever going to complete your customer experience outside in mission? I think, you know, one of the things that group, you know, right now Backbase is around a thousand people and, and we were able to kind of grow the company that way by, by always be 100% focused just on, on our customers, the banks and their end customers. So it kind of created, uh, I would say a bit of a, a, almost like the lean startup kind of philosophy of Eric Rice, like, you know, doesn't matter about the size of the company. It's not about the technology. It's all about, you know, what are your assumptions about what is needed in the market and how do you work with real customers to validate with them? So the, the boring answer is for the next 10 years, we basically will continue with that formula. And it is genuinely, we're in this for the long run. Uh, clearly, uh, we have no no requirement to, to kind of exit or to, to sell the company. We're really in it for the long run, five to 10 years at a minimum to really kind of change the industry and to drive innovation. And that's kind of in a people first manner. And what I hear from our clients is that they are really rooting for that. They say, this is almost like refreshing that there's a, a genuine a FinTech company with a critical skill that it also has real firepower where someone really cares about innovation and customer experience and uh, you know raising the bar. So that's a lot of fun uh, for me personally and as well for the whole Backbase team. So you know what's next? Uh, we're gonna continue to raise the bar and um, you know, this is a perfect moment in time to be exactly in this industry because uh, it's not boring right now. A lot of stuff is happening and this thing is in, in massive transition. So it's also real fun and a, a real challenge to, to contribute to that and uh, you know to participate in that, that whole movement. Well, with so many physical branches around the world not being able to open as they once were, you, you're, you're having to base, they basically build that. There's, 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 there's no shortage of work or it's, it's more about uh, finding the right operating model with the banks. I mean, there's, but it's really about how to, how to help banks, not only with the technology, but also with their operating model. And maybe also to a degree, 
uh, slightly on their culture. Although the culture part is really difficult for Backbase. We, we can help them with a lot of things. And, you know, uh, th there's also really leadership uh, required on uh, from the bank. And, and, and fortunate enough, especially compared with five years uh, ago, you now see that the vast majority of the banks, uh, you know, have that understanding, have that commitment, have that level of urgency, and there's therefore then also an open mindset uh, to learn and to become more digital. Yeah. Pretty excellent. Um, lastly, where is the best place for people to reach out to you directly and uh, and find out more about Backbase? Oh, uh, you, of course, they can always go to the Backbase website, but uh, people can find me on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, so just uh, Google for the CEO Backbase, and you probably will find my uh, LinkedIn details uh, on Google. Are you, are you not on TikTok, Jaak? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jaak, uh, Jaak, everyone. Hey, All right. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everybody Enjoy. for uh, attending and being here. Very much appreciate it. Thanks, Ali. Real fun.
So thank you so much for being here, Marche. I'm pronouncing that correctly, right? You are. Thank yeah. you for having me. <laughs> From Le Petit Marche. Um, yeah, I mean, I sent over a couple questions, but always love hearing directly from the source a little bit about um do you know how you got into the industry and and what inspired you to do that and just like your personal story i started off as a little market i was selling produce and soap uh, i definitely did not have uh, an intention of becoming a restaurateur that i had become it was a gradual process it's something that i i i fell into quite frankly yeah. Um, as a result of the recession and, uh, you know, in the very beginning of, of the, the little market, uh, it truly was that. So it was not um, food centric. I had food was kind of secondary. It was on the back burner mm -hmm. um, because I literally only had uh, plug in appliances at the time. So the intention was truly to be a little market yeah. with a sandwich counter that housed my mom's uh, famous soups and a few sandwiches and paninis. And it's something that I just had to learn as I got into it because the concept as it was originally intended um, crashed and burned quite, quite frankly after the first three months because that is when the recession hit us hard and fast after about three months of me being opening. So I had to make a pivot. And so was she, one of my questions is, is someone, who's someone who's inspired you? It seems that she had a huge influence on like food in your life. If you're served as serving um, dishes that are connected to her. Absolutely. Yeah. My mom and grandma, you know, my, my mother, uh, is a product of the South, uh, down in the Gulf of Mississippi. Yeah. Uh, my grandmother, same, uh, you know, my grandmother had my mom at a very young age. She was only 15 years old. Yeah. Um, and she was completely illiterate. I could not read or write, but yeah. was able to cook her way through life, uh, by way of chefing and, in restaurants all along the coast of Mississippi. And so that's how my mom uh, gained her chops. Mm -hmm. And subsequently, that's how I gained my chops. So it's passed down from grandma, who mm -hmm. was really an inspiration being 15 and, and unable really to um, really manage in this world uh, without having an education or being able to read or write. So it's pretty miraculous that she was able to I, uh, you know, get through life and raise my mom, who's an amazing woman, was an amazing woman. Unfortunately, mom passed away last year. Um, but that is where it all came from. It all began with my grandmother uh, and, and her southern roots in Mississippi along the Mississippi coast. Do you do like daily specials and like, tell me a little bit more. Obviously, you just mentioned the influence of your, of your grandma and your mom, but um, like the creative process of creating uh, your menu. The creative process is something that I, I would say is uh, definitely not over, overly complicated. It is almost overly simplified. Uh, I really take uh, popular items like French toast and put my own twist on them, turn it into a sandwich, throw those eggs and that meat inside, slather it with syrup and hot butter, you know, yeah. things that take the, you know, the traditional spin on French toast up a notch. So that's what uh, the creative process is for me in terms of, uh, in terms of coming up with unique uh, menu items. I'm also a very good listener. I have listened to my customers. I have listened to my staff. And I have several amazing dishes on my menu right now as a result of just listening. Uh, I have a menu item called The Sarah, which is named after Sarah, who mm -hmm. created it. It's a yeah. pretty, pretty amazing turkey sandwich with yeah. a homemade rose, rosemary aioli. Uh, and that was all inspired by a former employee who I'm still very much in contact with. Uh, and I have about two other menu items on that menu that originated really from, from people who gave me ideas, oh, staff wow. members and customers alike. So I definitely don't pretend like I know it all. I definitely don't pretend like I, I am like the chef of all chefs. No, I'm absolutely willing and open to learn and listen. And, uh, and not take this as though it's something that I already have in the bag. I've been very humble about it the entire way. Is there anything else you want to share before we, I mean, I listened to you for hours, but. The vibe, the yeah. vibe of the place, the feel. It feels amazing when you walk into my place. You're yeah. going to get hit with my family's pictures. You're going to get hit with uh, hearty hellos and welcomes. You're going to just feel welcome and you're going to kind of feel like you got a hug just by walking through the door.
Hi everyone, my name is John from Brella and I'm going to show you a quick video on how to set up your Brella account and profile. The Brella platform optimizes virtual networking and a well-constructed profile is the best way to make the most of your online networking experience. This is what a completed profile looks like. Let's get started. First, follow the link to join your event and create your event account. If you use a social media authentication, your profile picture and information will be pulled automatically. Once you have accepted the user agreement with Brella, click join event and enter the join code. You only have to do this once, and after you've successfully completed these steps, you'll see a screen like this. Click on start networking and select the days you'll be attending the event. You can search for an interest in the top bar. And when you select an interest, you can choose your reason for networking, whether it's simply to network, to buy or sell, or many more. You can also scroll through the list to find the most relevant interests for you. Let's pick a few more here, and then we'll proceed. Then you'll write a small pitch introducing yourself and click start networking. Brilla will match you with people who have similar interests. To see your information, click you in the top, then click edit my profile. You can change your introduction or your interests or restart the joint process. To complete your account level information, click on your profile photo in the top right, then click account. Here, you can change your email, adjust your names, add your company and title, and also your social media links. When you're all finished, click save changes. Once your profile and account are completed, you are ready to start making connections at your event. I hope you enjoy the event and feel free to reach out to us at support at brella.io or visit our help center at help.brella.io. I'm Grant Wayne Scott with the Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce. You just saw some highlights from around our great state, Georgia. As you can see, it's a thriving, diverse, and global region. And today at FinTech South, the Atlanta stage becomes the world stage. And I'm Christina Morris from FinTech Atlanta. Each year at FinTech South, we get requests from consulates, trade groups, and FinTech associations from all around the globe about bringing a delegation here to Atlanta. We're excited that through this virtual summit, we can host these partners in Atlanta and help them bring along delegations of attendees from all over the 